Denise, blindfolded and bound, made a clandestine call to 911 from the back seat of a vehicle with her kidnapper's phone. She quickly tried to give the operator as much information as she could before her abductor discovered her and the call was cut off. But before we get into this episode, we would like to offer our deepest condolences to the family of Denise, who made a desperate attempt to seek help by calling 911 on the day she was kidnapped. Sadly, it was just one of many unsuccessful attempts to rescue her. Denise Amberley was a 21-year-old blissfully married to the love of her life and raising two wonderful children. She and Nathan Lee her husband first met in high school, and their love blossomed soon after graduation when they tied the knot. Not long after, they were blessed with their first son, Noah, and two years later, with Adam. Despite the financial strain of starting a family so young, Nathan and Denise were still happy and determined to make the best of their situation. When looking for housing options, they found a newly constructed rental in Northport, Florida, an affordable location close to both of their parents. Though Denise's parents were concerned about raising children in such an isolated area, her father recognized the financial blessing of the house for the couple. Though the neighborhood was relatively deserted due to the 2008 housing market crash, Nathan and Denise saw it as an opportunity to provide their kids with a peaceful environment. On January 17, 2008, it was just like any other day, Nathan went to work and Denise stayed home looking after the kids. At around 11 a.m., Nathan called Denise, as was his usual practice, and they talked for about five minutes. During the conversation, Nathan asked Denise to switch off the central cooling system and open the windows to save money. Denise told him she had already done this and hung up the phone. Nathan got off work at around 3 p.m. and called Denise to let her know he was on his way home. This time, however, Denise didn't respond. Nathan tried calling her eight more times during his way home but still got no response. This was unusual, but Nathan wasn't too concerned until he pulled into the driveway. That's when he noticed all the windows of the house were closed, despite Denise telling him she had opened them. Upon entering the home, Nathan found no sign of Denise. He also noticed that both children were sharing the same crib, which was contrary to Denise's usual practices. He found Denise's phone, keys, and purse still in the house and despite the heat all the windows were closed but not secured another odd observation. Nathan's worry intensified as he searched the home for Denise and found no trace of her. All the windows were closed and unsecured, adding to Nathan's concerns and who immediately called 911. At 3.29 p.m., Nathan placed a call to 911 and reported Denise missing. After hanging up, he quickly dialed his father-in-law, Rick, who was a police sergeant with 25 years of experience at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office. At the time, Rick was expecting a call from both Nathan and Denise, who he had invited to dinner. Instead, he received a disturbing call from his son-in-law, Nathan, informing him that he had called 911. With 25 years of experience in law enforcement, Rick recognized the lack of urgency given to reports of spouses going missing and decided to take matters into his own hands. He made it his mission to get the police department to take his daughter's disappearance seriously and reached out to his chief and co-workers, pleading with them to help. Thankfully, they all agreed to do whatever they could to locate her. The police went to the Lee residence to collect evidence and then visited their neighbor's home to ask if they had any knowledge of Denise's disappearance. Jennifer, one of the neighbors, said she had seen a suspicious person driving around the neighborhood and then entering the Lee's driveway. She gave the police a description of the car, which was a green Chevrolet Camaro. Armed with this information, the police issued a be on the lookout alert for the green Chevrolet Camaro. At 6.14 p.m., 911 received a call from a woman screaming and crying into the phone, Denise, a family member of Rick and Nathan who were at Nathan's home. After hearing the recording, they recognized Denise's voice and realized their worst fear had come true, she had been kidnapped and was in grave danger. Denise had managed to get hold of her captor's phone and dialed 911, trying to give the operator her name street address and the color of the kidnapper's car whilst also letting them know the kidnapper was a stranger. However, just as Denise was about to give more information, the kidnapper discovered she was on the phone and the call went silent. Upon learning that his daughter had gone missing, Rick immediately informed all those he knew to be on the lookout. He even got the highway control and the marshal service out searching for Denise. Since she had been able to call 911 on her captor's cell phone, Nathan was confident that the police could trace the location. Sadly, the phone belonging to the kidnapper was a cheap, prepaid cell phone, also known as a burner phone, which did not have a GPS device that would allow the police to trace its location. However, the police were able to get pings from nearby cell towers, though the information was not enough to pinpoint Denise. Utilizing the cell phone number, the police were able to identify the owner of the phone as Michael King, whom neither Nathan nor Rick recognized. 
Nine minutes after Denise's call, another operator received a call from Sabrina Muxlow, who reported that her father's cousin was forcing a woman into a green Chevrolet Camaro and that the woman appeared desperate for help. Denise was only four miles away from the home when Sabrina made her call. Shortly after, a 911 operator received another call from Jane Kowalski. She had stopped at a stoplight and heard a child screaming in terror coming from the car next to her. When she looked over, she made eye contact with the driver, a white male, and realized that it was Denise screaming for help. In desperation, Jane banged on the passenger window, hoping that someone might hear it and come to her rescue. Little did she know, the driver was Michael King. As Jane glared at him, he put his hand up to shush her and proceeded to try and subdue the person in the passenger seat. Horrified, Jane quickly dialed 911, believing she was witnessing a child abduction. She attempted to keep up with the car and give the operator the license plate number, but the operator was slow to respond. Desperately, Jane tried to follow the car, even asking the operator if she should, but Michael noticed and quickly changed lanes, leaving Jane behind stuck in traffic. At 6.42 p.m., the police went to Michael's home and broke in to find it empty. They began searching the property, and upon entering a room, they discovered signs that it had recently been used for torture. A duct tape and long strands of hair were attached to it. Soon after the discovery, a 911 call was made by Harold Muxlow, Sabrina's father, from a payphone. He provided a vague description of the car that was involved in Denise's abduction, a green Chevrolet Camaro. Michael had gone to Harold's house to borrow a flashlight, gas can, and a shovel, as his lawnmower had gotten stuck in mud in his front yard. Just then, Denise was able to climb out of Michael's car, screaming for Harold to call the cops. Shocked, Harold didn't know what to do or think. When he asked Michael what was happening, Michael replied, don't worry about it, before forcing Denise back into the car and speeding away. Understanding that his cousins had a history of bad relationships, Harold assumed it to be a minor domestic dispute and informed his daughter Sabrina, who then called 911. The incident Harold had seen with Michael was weighing heavily on his mind, so he went to Michael's house to check out the lawnmower story. When he arrived, there was no one there and it turned out the story was false. This prompted him to call the police. Despite his attempts to stay anonymous, the police were able to deduce that he was Sabrina's father and Michael's cousin. At 9.16 p.m., a state trooper pulled over a vehicle that matched the description of Michael King's 1995 green Camaro. Michael was behind the wheel, and, to the trooper's surprise, he was soaked wet and Denise was not with him. Upon further inspection, the trooper found a cell phone with the battery removed and a muddy shovel in the car. This alarming discovery caused Rick. Denise's father, to be notified of Michael's whereabouts in hopes that his daughter was safe. Unfortunately, these hopes were not realized, and Denise was still missing. Though Michael King was found, he refused to tell the police what he had done. Instead, he pretended to be a victim himself, claiming that he had been abducted with Denise by a stranger who had offered them a ride. He was taken to a police station, where he was questioned. Hours later, Michael was allowed a visit from his cousin Harold who had called 911 to report Denise's disappearance. During the visit, Michael told Harold his version of the story, he said that he had attempted to call 911 while being held captive, and he had no idea where the kidnapper had taken Denise, as the kidnapper had let him go first and continued to drive off with Denise still in the car. Michael also tried to take credit for Denise being able to call 911. Harold and Michael had a heated conversation during their interrogation. Harold urged Michael to take a lie detector test to prove his innocence but Michael refused and stated that he would not do anything before he had a lawyer. Michael then mentioned a location where he thought Denise might have been taken, yet, when the police searched the area, they found no evidence. Since the police were not convinced by his story, they charged him with kidnapping. After two days of searching, the volunteers and police had finally located Denise Amberley. A K-9 unit had discovered a freshly dug hole in a marshy field, where they found the unfortunate girl's naked body. She had been shot in the head. The family of Denise expressed their grief and gratitude for the efforts of all who helped find her. The search had come to an end, but the pain of the family's loss will be felt for a long time. With Denise's body recovered, the police could now focus on piecing together a profile of Michael King and determining his motive. At the time, King was 36 years old and had recently relocated from Michigan to Florida after going through a bitter divorce. He was unemployed and had ceased going to work around three months prior to the incident. He had a clean criminal record but there had been several complaints made by neighbors that he had been engaging in mischievous activities in the neighborhood. After witnessing what she believed to be a child abduction, 
Jane contacted the police and recognized Michael's picture from the news. She wanted to know if the police wanted her to provide any information about the incident, however, her call had not been sent out by the dispatchers. For the next two days, Jane kept calling the police department until investigators uncovered records of her 911 call. Finally, she was able to provide the police with her valuable information about the abduction. During an internal investigation of Jane's 911 call, it was uncovered that the operator who answered the call suspected it was related to Denise's kidnapping. She shouted this information to other dispatchers, but it was not entered into the system. And all she did was to shout it out to other dispatchers. Across the island the dispatcher who heard her never sent out the information as they claimed the chaos of that night was overwhelming. And they forgot to add insult to injury. Multiple deputies were stationed near Michael's location at the time of the 911 call from Jane. In a sworn statement one deputy said that he parked alongside Toledo Blade Boulevard which means Michael could have driven past him while Denise still screaming for her life in the back seat. Denise's family believes that she did everything in her power to save her life that day, while the Charlotte County Police Department failed miserably. Investing the green Chevrolet Camaro investigators found clues that might have been planted by Denise like hair strands pulled out from the roots matching that of Denise and a ring which was given to her by Nathan on their very first valentine which she never removed was also found in the back seat of the car. Meanwhile Michael King continued to play innocent and a lab report showed a match between his DNA and that found in Denise's body. Now Michael was not only accused of murder, but he was also accused of rape. Six days after the abduction a massive funeral was held in her honor. The entire town came to pay respect to Denise and her family. Though the evidence stacked up against Michael as immense and he pleaded not guilty during his first trial. Nathan filed a lawsuit against Charlotte County, Florida, alleging that the police department had failed to protect his wife, Denise Amber Lee, due to their carelessness. He sought damages for the pain and suffering the family had endured in her untimely death. Rick Lee, Denise's father, also testified in the case in an effort to ensure that the same mistakes would not be made again. In April of 2009, the jury sided with Nathan and the Lee family and awarded Nathan and his two children a total of $1.1 million in damages. This was the largest verdict ever awarded in Charlotte County for a civil rights lawsuit. In addition to the monetary compensation, the jury also found that the Charlotte County Police Department had been negligent in the handling of the case and that the jury had failed to properly investigate the threats made against Denise by her kidnapper. The family hoped that with this verdict, other police departments throughout the country would take Denise's story as a lesson and take the necessary steps to ensure that this type of tragedy would never happen again. By bringing attention to the case, Nathan and the Lee family have done their part in ensuring that Denise Amber Lee's life was not lost in vain. The police investigation into the murder of Denise had uncovered damning evidence against Michael. Witnesses had testified that he had a history of violent, sexual assaults against Denise and that he had also made multiple threats of physical harm towards her in the past. Surveillance footage and forensic evidence from the scene of the crime confirmed Michael's involvement and showed that he had brutally attacked Denise before shooting her in the head with a handgun and burying her body in his backyard. After the medical examiners conducted their investigations, it was revealed that Denise had several defensive wounds that indicated she had fought back. These included bruises on her wrists, which were likely caused by being bound, and a gunshot wound to her head above her right eyebrow. The gunshot wound was determined to have caused an explosion in her eye and resulted in blood entering her lungs, indicating she had suffered pain and distress before her death. On August 2009, Michael was found guilty of the heinous assault and murder of Denise Amberley. After two long years of anguish and agony, her family finally got justice for their beloved daughter. Michael was sentenced to 30 years for the assault, life in prison for the kidnapping, and death for the murder. Though he still awaits his death sentence. The story of Denise Amber Lee is a chilling reminder of the consequences of violence and crime. Let us all take a moment to remember her, and to honor her memory by speaking out against injustice and violence. Let us all strive for a world where such tragedies never happen again. Please like and subscribe to my channel if you found this video useful as it will be a great support for me.